is not the one who is crushing planes. We discovered that God is not the one who is uh, killing children through malaria. We discovered that God is not the one who is bringing suffering on his children to teach them a lesson. We also discovered that it is a prevalent message in the church. You know, when you're going through stuff, people just come and tell, man, it's God's will. When people go to a funeral and a child has been killed by an accident, they say, man, God has done his will. We discovered last week, so if you're not here, please make sure you pick that up. Amen? We discovered also that this seems to happen in the uh, communities where they teach on the extreme sovereignty of God. Okay? We discovered that God is indeed sovereign, but sovereignty does not mean omni-control. It doesn't mean that God exercises omni-control. What do I mean by that? It does not mean that because God is sovereign, he controls every single thing that happens in your life. Uh, amen. Amen? It is not God in control that gets you to marry the wrong person and go through a divorce so you can come out of it and teach someone else who's going through the same. That's not how God operates. In fact, I was talking to someone. We put out our messages on, we put our messages on social media. I was talking to someone and they uh, wrote me a message. They say, but pastor, we know that God is in control all the time. And sometimes he saves gangsters so that the gangsters can teach the other gangsters that gangstership is not good. And I was like, God does not need a gangster to teach this word. I mean, Jesus was the greatest teacher, right? He taught people who were in adultery. He didn't have to be an adulterer before. But it seems over here, people's logic is like, yeah, you have, God does not use you if you haven't gone through something. <laughs> Where did they get that from? <laughs> Amen? Amen? So God is sovereign, but sovereign does not mean om omni-control. Because if you believe that, you are going to take a posture of passivity, you will be passive. And the devil will come and eat your lunch for free. Because guess what? You take an attitude of Kwe sara sara, whatever will be, will be. And when things happen to you, you just roll over and play dead. Because guess what? After all, it came from the Lord. But when you know that there are certain things that will happen that are out of the will of God, you brace up and fight. Amen. Uh, amen. We discovered John 10, verse 10 says, The enemy, the thief, Satan, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus flipped it and he said, I came that you might have life and have it how? More abundantly. Amen. So God is coming to give you life. God is not the one who is killing people. Here are a few uh, synonyms for the word sovereign. God is sovereign. What does that mean? It means God is chief. Amen. Amen. It means God is first. It means God is grand. He's the greatest, highest, numero uno, preeminent, premier, principal, supreme. And none of these words say controller. Uh -huh. wow. A lot of people in the church believe that nothing happens unless God wills it to happen. There's a lot of things that are happened that God did not will for them to happen. Yeah. Yeah. He does not force people into his will. In fact, God's will is not automatic. That's why we have to pray and say, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have to pray it to come to earth. Because uh, if you don't pray it, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And part of what they believe as well is that, I mean, if you're going to believe that nothing happens except that which is in the will of God, part of what they believe is that um, we do not have any free will. Because, guess what? If everything that happens to you is because of what God has willed it for you, then you're not going to have any free will. In fact, one of the most influential preachers of the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon, and I'm not saying his name because I'm against him. He was a mighty man of God, but on this point he was wrong. Amen. Amen. So it doesn't matter who you are. When you are against scripture, when you are not in line with scripture, we'll call you out in love. Amen. 
Notice what he said, Charles Spurgeon said, philosophy and religion both discard at once the very thought of free will. And then he closed his statement by saying, free will is nonsense. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 23, verse 37, to see if Charles was right. Matthew chapter number 23, verse 37. If you have it, you can say, I have it. Watch what it says. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. This is God speaking. He says, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not what? I didn't hear that. You were not what? In other words, you did not want. I wanted to gather you or I wanted to bring you to myself, but you used your free will to say, I don't want. And in fact, that's what distinguishes us from the animal kingdom. Free will is the only thing. Animals live on instinct. Human beings live on on free will. We are the only creature that has the power to choose everything, including God. You can choose or reject God. And God will honor your free will. Amen? Amen. I know there are pastors, some of my friends, you know, clergy, that believe that they have super free will, they have super will over people's free will. And, you know, someone will come to them and say, hey, you know, pastor, you know, I, I saw this girl and whatever, whatever. And they say, no, don't take that one. I'm sensing that you must take this one. <laughs> <laughs> but you can never override people's free will. This is what I do when people typically come to me, you know, Henry, hey, pastor, you know, I, I, I'm, I see this girl in church and I think I like her. <laughs> and I'll give my counsel. I'll be like, man, I think she's a great chick. Okay, I think she's beautiful, and I think you should marry her this year. That's my advice, right? But he has his own free will to take my advice or not. And here's what, what they typically do, Tino. They usually... <laughs> today, I just hit two Tinos in one sentence. <laughs> they usually take their time, two years... Three years, four years, five years, seven years. What are they doing? They're exercising their free will. And me as the pastor, I think they should have married her in year one. Amen. But I still can't superimpose my free will. <laughs> but then there comes another brother. Usually there comes another brother who knows Jesus is coming back soon. <laughs> And he has no time to waste. <laughs> he just joins the church. A yeah, pastor, I see this girl. Like, oh man, I think she's a great girl. Take it. Three months. <laughs> We're already marrying them. Amen. What's happening? It's free will. And free will, no one can override your free will. No one can stop you. You know, today before I came, I went into my closet. And I looked at all the clothes that I had. And I picked this denim jacket. I didn't see an angel with a flaming sword. I said, thou shalt wear this denim jacket. to No, I didn't. I went and I picked this one. And guess what? God Almighty and all of heaven let me out of the house wearing this one. The same way they will let you out of the house if you make a stupid decision. The same way you let you out of, the, out of the house if you choose ignorance. Same way you let you out of the house if you choose poverty. How many of you know that poverty is a choice? Yeah. Man, I'm preaching good already. Yeah. I was raised in poverty. Yeah. I lived in a three-roomed house, not three-bedroomed house. Three-roomed house. Used to sleep under the kitchen table. And one day I made a choice. I'm tired of this. Yeah. Amen. 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 And it started changing the way I thought. And the Bible is very clear. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And the minute I started thinking differently, things started to shift. Amen? Amen. 
So free will is real. Let's go and look at something else. Deuteronomy chapter number 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter number 30, verse 19. If you have it, you can say, I have it. We'll wait for you. Do you have it? Okay. Watch what it says. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before who? You. I didn't hear that. You. I did not hear that. You. Come on, preach with me. You. I have set before you. When? What did I set before you? Life and death. Blessing and cursing. I mean, it's like you're in a multiple choice exam. Uh, yeah. Those of you who have driver's license, uh, licenses, you go to your driver's license test and they give you a test like this. Watch what it says after that. Therefore, choose, choose life. Yeah. Would you fail? No. I mean, he just said which car will go first? A, B, C. The answer is C. <laughs> That's the test. And people will still fail. <laughs> he said, I've said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, I'm trying to help you. Therefore, choose something that is wise. Choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Amen. Here's another scripture that validates the power of free will. Human beings are what I like to call free will moral agents. That's right. We make choices and God respects your choices. Even Satan respects your choices. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's the power of free will. Let's go to Joshua chapter number 24 verse 15. Joshua chapter number 24 verse 15. Watch what he says. This is Joshua addressing the nation. So the people had gotten into all kinds of stuff. I mean, they had started serving all kinds of gods and stuff like that. And then Joshua, uh, God gave Joshua this message to take to the church. So this was his sermon on the day. And he, Joshua got up and he said, And if it seems evil to you, for you to serve God, do what? I didn't hear that. Now, if there is no free will, why would he even say that? If everything that happens is because God has ordained it, why would he even tell you you, you, have, you have an opportunity to choose something different? He says, man, if you don't want to serve God, today choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me, and he starts making his own choice. That's right. mm. You know what he's also showing there? He's showing you that spiritual leaders cannot make the choice for you. Right. President Zuma cannot make the choice for you to be prosperous. It has to be your personal choice. President Zuma cannot make the choice for you to start making things happen in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It has to be a personal choice. He says, hey, church, you, when you get back home, you make your choices as to which God you want to serve. But as for me, the only jurisdiction I have is my house. That's right. Yeah. Mm. And I want to talk to every husband, every father in the house. Your house is your jurisdiction. And you, make, you can make the decision of which God to serve for your house. Because that's your jurisdiction. Amen. Uh, amen. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that was his choice. Amen. And everyone else had the same choice. So free will is real. It's everywhere throughout scripture. Let's go to a few more scriptures. Thank you, Jesus. Luke chapter number 7, verse 30. Luke 7, verse 30. Watch what it says. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected 
the what? The will of God. I didn't hear that. The will of God. Notice the Pharisees rejected the will of God. What does that show us? It shows us that the will of God can be rejected. I mean, scripture is very clear in Revelations 3.20 that Jesus stands at the door of your heart knocking and you have the right to either let him in or keep him outside. And he's not going to force himself in. You know why? Because he's a gentleman. And it's the same with every other promise of God in scripture. If you don't want to get healed, no one will force you to be healed, including God. If you don't want to be prospered, no one will force you to be prospered. And there are some people who genuinely don't want to be well. They genuinely don't want to be healed. You know why? Because sometimes it's advantageous to be sick. Because you don't get to wash dishes, right? You don't get to do the laundry. Man, I can just chill and they serve me. After all, it's the only time I get to eat real good food. Because they're asking me what I want all the time. So there's some people who genuinely don't want to be well. So how does he treat them? He keeps them sick. Not because it is his will for them to be sick, but because they don't want to. They are rejecting the will of God, just like the Pharisees did. They rejected the will of God. They said, hey, we don't want. Man, I always tell people, uh, the Bible says God has plans to prosper you. But the real question is not even that. The real question is, are you planning to be prospered by God? The real question is, will you let him prosper you? All right, cool. Let's go to Philippians chapter number 1, verse 21. So we learned now that the will of God can be rejected. The will of God is not automatic. Okay? If you don't enforce it, if you don't choose life, life will not happen to you automatically. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, this even goes beyond just the principles of God and the promises of God. Even life, you know, when we were doing the relationship series, a lot of people, some people asked the question, is there a thing called the one? You know, just God sovereignly picks one person that I should marry. Do you remember the question? And we said, hey, there is no such thing as the one. Whoever you choose becomes the one. See, because a lot of people want to cope out. They want to give, put it on God. Yeah, that's right. You know, they want to pick someone and when they want out, they say, ah, no, you know, I think I married the wrong one. So let me try again. <laughs> no, whoever you pick becomes the one. Because you've just exercised the power of free will. Amen? Amen? Philippians chapter number 1, verse 21. Just a preview. The apostle Paul is sitting in a prison and is uh, facing a death penalty for preaching the gospel. Okay? Can you picture it? He's sitting in prison facing the death penalty. Everything is about to end. I mean, he's just he's sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? And this was his attitude. Watch what he says. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Next verse. But if I live on this flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. So he's saying, for me to die is still advantageous because I'm going to be with the Lord. I'm going in glory to be with the Lord. But if I stay here, it's advantageous for you because I'll be here in flesh to preach the gospel. And he's sitting in prison, and he's about to be killed for preaching the gospel, right? He's facing the death penalty. Watch what the apostle Paul says. Yet, what shall I choose? What are you talking about? <laughs> you are in prison about to be killed. Yeah. I thought you had no choice. I mean, the apostle Paul is taking this free will thing way too far, right? <laughs> Say, well, what am I going to choose? You know why? Because he knew he still had a choice. Because uh, you always have a choice. Amen. Just hunt your neighbor and say, you have a choice. Those who are single, hunt them and say, you have a choice to get out of that relationship if it's not working. <laughs> you have a choice. If it's not working, just get out. He says, what am I going to choose? Next verse. Watch what he says. For I am hard pressed between the two. 
<laughs> I mean, this guy thinks he has a choice. I mean, he's thinking, man, I don't even know. <laughs> I'm confused right now. Dude, you're facing a death penalty. You are in prison. And he's sitting there thinking, I'm actually confused. I don't know whether I should go on and be with the Lord. You know what that shows us? That shows us you even have a choice concerning when you die. That's right. Amen. Uh, that's right. Amen. How many of you know that you don't have to be sick to die? Yeah. Uh, Man, I know of people that said, hey, call all my family relatives. I want to see my grandchildren because I'm getting ready to be with the Lord. Yeah. And then they saw everyone, kissed everyone, spent time with everyone, and within a few hours they were gone. Uh, you know, they didn't have to be sick. Man, you don't have to be sick and make everyone miserable. Yeah. <laughs> because you don't know what you want or when to go. <laughs> there are just some people who don't know when to go. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I had breakfast with someone just this past week, and they were saying, um, you know, my, my mom is like, what, 85 and so on and so forth. And, you know, they were already planning about, you know, what to do when their mom <laughs> dies and stuff like that. Man. Aaron, I know Aaron is here, but white people are crazy, man. <laughs> Just like, man, we're going to do this and when mom is gone. And I was like, man, but mom is here. I mean, she might live to be 100. She's like, no, I don't want her to live to be 100. I said, why not? It's because she'll be a nag to me. <laughs> you know, she must just know when to go. I mean, with black people, the only people that don't know where to, when to go it's visitors who purposefully <laughs> came to your house for dinner. <laughs> Man, they can smell the food and they just sitting there talking all the stories and you are praying, man, they must go now. <laughs> and they just sitting there like, no, we are here <laughs> until you serve the food. <laughs> and the minute they finish eating, ah, okay, we'll see you later. Watch what he says. He says, For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Next verse. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this. Now he starts making a choice. I know. Not I think. Not I speculate. Not there is a high chance. I know. I know that I shall remain. In other words, I've made a choice. Yeah, right. It doesn't matter what I'm faced with. I still have a choice in the matter. Amen. I mean, if the prison officers had heard this conversation, they would have thought, man, this guy is cocky. He's arrogant. <laughs> you, know, you know, you must think our ropes are not strong. When we hang him, you know, it will just snap. Why is he this cocky? You know why? Because he knew the power of free will, the power of choice. And he made a choice, and we know that the Apostle Paul was released, managed to visit the Philippian church, and died in his 60s. You know why? Because he understood he had a choice in every matter. Let's go to Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 32. What about the other disciples that died? Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 32. I'm going to read this to verse 35, if it helps. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Next verse. Who through faith subdued the kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises. Through what? Through faith. Notice what you can do through faith. You can subdue kingdoms Amen. for your business, with your career. You can subdue kingdoms through faith. Not through money, not through connections, through faith. Did you see that? Worked righteousness through faith. Obtained the promises of God through faith. Stopped the mouths of lions. Uh, that's right. Next verse. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant, valiant in battle, turned to flight in the armies of the aliens. Next verse. Women received their death, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not what? 
I didn't hear that. Not what? Not what? I mean, if you have to not accept something, it means it's available, right? They didn't accept it because I know some of you were thinking, man, what about the disciples who were killed against their will? Here's your answer. They didn't accept deliverance. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. There was one gentleman, only one disciple who died of old age. John the Revelator. The man couldn't die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They t took his eyes out, still couldn't die. Yeah. Fed him with poison, still couldn't die. Boiled him in cooking oil, still couldn't die. You know why? Because he didn't want to die. Uh, that's right. It was against his free will. Yeah. So the only thing they had to do was to uh, uh, put him on the island in isolation. At the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelations. You know why? Because he accepted the deliverance. Mm. He used his free will to make a choice. Amen. But when you live your life without the realization that you have the power to choose, you will become passive and just accept anything and everything that comes your way. Amen. Amen. And unfortunately, the doctrine of the extreme sovereignty of God that's what it teaches. It has made the church passive. Yeah. And we accept everything and anything. If you fall sick, you don't fight back because you think, well, it might just be God's will. I mean, if you really believe that, you wouldn't take medication, right? I mean, if God gave you uh, some form of ailment to teach you a lesson, why take medication to reduce the impact of the lesson? <laughs> You should just let it run its full course, right? Yeah. So you come out of it having learned everything that God wanted you to learn. <laughs> but we go and take some medication just to numb the pain. Man, you are numbing the lesson, right? <laughs> you won't learn as much as he wants you to learn. <laughs> so you have free will. You have the power to choose. Hallelujah. Yeah. I said hallelujah. Here's what uh, other uh, early church fathers had to say about free will. Uh, this is Justin Mata. He said, we have learned from the prophets and we hold it to be true that punishments, chastisements, rewards are rendered according to the, to the merit of each man's action. Otherwise, if all things happened by fate, then nothing is in our own power. For it is predestined that one man be good and another be evil. Then the first is not deserving of praise and the other not to be blamed. Unless humans have the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free will, they are not accountable for their actions, whatever that action may be. That's right. Even the court system know that you have free will. That's why they will hold you accountable for your decisions. Amen. Amen. This is what Irenaeus said. He's also an early church father. In men as well as in angels, God has placed the power of choice. Because both humans and angelic beings are rational beings. God created Lucifer, the angel, the worshiper. And Lucifer's free will made him Satan. The devil. It was what he chose in his heart. God didn't make him the devil. Amen. Go with me to Isaiah 14 from verse 12 to 14. Isaiah 14. Is this making sense? Watch what it says. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. Next verse. For you have said in your heart. What did you say? Just those two words. Can you read them? I did you see that? Yeah. Just those two words. What did he say? I will. In other words, he's making a choice. Uh. I will ascend into heaven. Those two words again. I will. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Those next two words. I 
I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Next verse. What he's saying? He's making a choice. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high God. This is Lucifer speaking. He made a choice to become the devil. It wasn't by fate. He said, I will five times. And his ego, they call it ego tripping. He was ego tripping, amen? His ego made him to think that he could become like God, amen? So if you're taking down notes, write this down. Choice determines, choices determine destinies. Let's go now to Romans chapter number 8, verse 28, in closing. Romans chapter number 8, verse 28. Now, here is a scripture that's interesting. Even unbelievers know this scripture. Everyone knows this scripture. And they usually use it when some form of tragedy hits. You know, they always say, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and to those who are called according to his purpose. In fact, they don't even read that far. They just say, and we know that all things work together for good. But we know that, you know, in the English language, you cannot start a sentence with the word end. Yeah. The word end, again, is a conjunction that connects two thoughts. Uh, Amen? Just like you can't go to Nando's and say what? I want to end chips. <laughs> We're like, no, what's, what's the, what, is it a burger? What, what's behind the end? You have to say, you can't just say end. Amen. So what's, let's find out what's before the word end. Let's go to verse 26. This is where the story begins. Now he who searches the hearts of men, what the mind of the spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints. Did I say verse 26? Let's go to verse 26. Likewise, the spirit also helps. The what? The spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Next verse. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And after you have done verse 26 and 27, in other words, after you have cooperated with the Holy Spirit in prayer, and now you can say we know that all things work together. Not only that, you have to continue reading. So the first qualification is that you have to pray. You have to make intercession with the Holy Spirit. The second qualification is to those who love God. Did you see that? I mean, there is a condition to the contract. That's the fine print. And we know that all things work together for good to those. T-H-O-S-E. Those. A specific group of people. Not everyone. Who are those? Those who love God. Those who make God first priority in their lives. Can you see that? So you can't just rock up from a Latini and say, all things work together. All things work together for my good. No, you can't. There is a qualification. Those who love God. Because all kinds of people use this. I mean, you make a foolish decision. Go against everyone's advice and marry a fool and turn around and try to use this scripture. It is not going to work. The Holy Spirit is telling you, do not do it. Mm. And then while you're in it, you turn around. Romans 8 verse 28. And we know. Vele, we know. Vele, we, we know that all things work together. No, they are not working for you. Amen. Because you didn't listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. You have to listen to the voice. Cooperate with him first. Love God, make him a priority in your life. And to those who are called according to his purpose. In other words, those who are believers. And those who seek to extend the kingdom of God. 
Those who are in God's will can stand up and say, and we know that all things work together for us because we love God and we are called according to his purpose. And not only that, because we make intercession, we cooperate with the Holy Spirit to make intercession for our lives and for all things around us. And as we do that, we can stand up and claim that all things are working together for our good. Amen? Why don't you stand on your feet? Thank you, Jesus. If you are here and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're saying, hey, pastor, I want to be a part of the family, just lift your hand wherever you are and we'll